again, friends. We're going to continue with Chapter 8 today. Hamlish Hospital is gone now and will probably never be rebuilt. If you want to visit it, you have to convince a farmer to let you borrow his mule, for nobody in the surrounding area is willing to go within 12 miles of its wreckage. And once you arrive, you can hardly blame them. The few scraps of the building that have survived are covered with a thick and prickly type of ivy called kudzu, which makes it difficult to see what the hospital looked like when the bottle airs first arrived in the BFD van. The confusing maps have been gnawed off the walls of the sagging staircases, so it is very hard to imagine how troublesome it was to find one's way through all the areas of the building. And the intercom system has long since crumbled away, with only a handful of square speakers left sitting among the ashen rubble. So it is impossible to imagine just how unnerving it was when Klaus and Sonny heard the latest announcement from Mateus. Attention, Mateus announced. There were no intercom speakers installed in the unfinished half of the hospital. So the two younger Baudelaire's had to listen very hard to hear the scratchy voice of their enemy coming from one of the outdoor speakers. Attention, attention. This is Mateus, the head of human resources. I am canceling the remainder of the hospital's inspections. We have found what we were looking for. There was a pause as Mateus moved away from the microphone. And as Klaus and Sonny listened very hard, they could hear the faint, faint noise of a triumphant high-pitched laughter coming from Ted, the head of resor human resources. Excuse me, he continued when his giggling fit was over. To continue, please be aware that two of the three Baudelaire murderers, Klaus and Sonny, I mean Clyde and Susie, Baudelaire, have been spotted in the hospital. If you see any children whom you recognize from the Daily Concilio, please capture them and notify the police. Mateus stopped talking and began to giggle again until the children heard the voice of Esme Squalor whispering, Darling, you forgot to turn off the intercom. Then there was a click and everything was silent. They caught her, Klaus said. Now that the sun had risen, it wasn't very cold in the, in the half-finished section of the hospital. But the middle bottle air shivered nonetheless. That's what Mateus meant when he said they had found what they were looking for. Danger, Sonny said grimly. She certainly is, Klaus said. We have to rescue Violet before it's too late. Burr, Sonny said, which meant, but we don't know where she is. She must be somewhere in the hospital, Klaus said. Otherwise, Mateus wouldn't still be here. He and Esme are probably hoping to capture us, too. Rance, Sonny said. And the file, Klaus agreed, taking page 13 out of his pocket where he'd been storing it for safekeeping, along with the scraps of Quagmire notebooks. Come on, Sonny, we've got to find our sister and get her out of here. Lingesto, Sonny said. I, sorry, I always have to laugh because it's going to say like three sentences out of one word. It's fantastic. <sighs> she meant that'll be tough. We'll have to wander around the hospital looking for her while other people will be wandering around the hospital looking for us. I know, Klaus said glumly. If anyone recognizes us from the Daily Punctilio, we'll be in jail before we can help Violet. Disguise, Sonny said. I don't know, Klaus said, looking around the half-finished room. All we have here are flashlights and a few drop cloths. I suppose if we wrap the drop cloths around us and put the flashlights on top of our heads, we could try to disguise ourselves as piles of construction materials. Good news, Sonny said, which meant, but piles of construction material materials don't wander around hospitals. Then we'll have to walk into the hospital without disguises, Klaus said. We'll just have to be extra careful. Sunny nodded emphatically. A word which here means as if she thought being extra careful was a very good plan. And Klaus nodded emphatically back. But as they left the half-finished wing of the hospital, the two children felt less and less emphatic about what they were doing. Ever since that terrible day at the beach when Mr. Poe brought them news of the fire, all three Baudelaire's had been extra careful all the time. They had been extra careful when they lived with Count Olaf and Sonny had, been, had still ended up dangling from a cage outside Olaf's tower room. They had been extra careful when they'd worked at the Lucky Smiles lumber mill and Klaus had still ended up hypnotized by Dr. Orwell. And now the Baudelaire's had been as careful as they could possibly be, but the hospital had turned out to be a hostile environment 
as anywhere the three children had ever lived. But just as Klaus and Sonny entered the finished half of Hemlish Hospital, their feet moving less and less emphatically, and their hearts beating faster and faster, they heard something that soothed, that soothed their savage beast. We are volunteers fighting disease, and we're careful all day long. If someone said that we were sad, that person would be wrong. There, coming around the corner, were the volunteers fighting disease, walking down the hall, singing their cheerful song, and carrying enormous branches of heart-shaped balloons. Branches. Eh, bunches. Whatever. Klaus and Sonny looked at one another and ran to catch up with the group. What better place to hide than among people who believed that no news was good news and so didn't read the newspaper. We visit people who are sick and try to make them smile, even if their noses bleed or if they cough a file. To the children's relief, the volunteer said, paid no attention as Klaus and Sonny infiltrated the group, a phrase which here means sneaked into the middle of a singing crowd. An especially cheerful singer seemed to be the only one who noticed, and she immediately handed a balloon to each newcomer. Klaus and Sonny held the balloon in front of their faces so that anybody passing by would see two volunteers with shiny helium-filled hearts instead of two accused criminals hiding in VFD. tra la la and fiddle dee, -dee. hope you get well soon, ho 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 and hee hee hee, have a heart-shaped balloon! As the volunteers reached the chorus of the song, they marched into the hospital room in order to start giving a cheerful attitude to their patients. Inside the room, each lying uncomfortably in a metal bed, were a man with both legs and casts and a woman with both arms and bandages. Still singing, a man from VFD handed one balloon to the man and tied another to the woman's cast because she could not hold it with her broken arms. Excuse me, said the man hoarsely. Could you please call a nurse for me? I was supposed to take some painkillers this morning, but nobody has come to give them to me. And I'd like a glass of water, the woman said in a weak voice, if it's not too much trouble. Sorry, the bearded man replied, pausing for a moment to tune his guitar. We don't have time to do things like that. We have to visit each and every room of the hospital, so we need to move quickly. Besides, another volunteer said, giving the two patients a huge grin. A cheerful attitude is a more effective way of fighting illness than painkillers or a glass of water. So cheer up and enjoy your balloon. The volunteer consulted a list he was holding. Next on the patient list is a man named Bernard Rooks. In room 105, of the plague. Hmm. Oh, sorry, of the plague ward. Come on, brothers and sisters. The members of VFD cheered and continued the song as they left the room. Klaus and Sonny peered around the balloons they were holding and looked at one another in hope. If we visit each and every room in the hospital, Klaus whispered to his sister, we're sure to find Violet. Mushroom, Sonny said, which meant, I agree, although it won't be pleasant to see all these sick people. <laughs> We visit people who are ill and try to make them laugh, even when the doctors say we must saw them in half. <laughs> Bernard Ruix turned out to be a man with a nasty hacking cough that shook his body so much he could scarcely hold his balloon. And it seemed to the two bottle children that a good humidifier would have been a more effective way to fight this disease than a cheerful attitude. As the members of VFC drowned out the cough with another verse of the song, Klaus and Sonny were tempted to run and find a humidifier and bring it back to Bernard Frudewicz. I'm saying that. I've said that three different ways. <laughs> Room. But they knew that Violet was in much more danger than someone with a cough. So they stayed hidden in the group. We sing and sing all night and day, and then we sing some more. We sing to boys with broken arms and girls whose throats are sore. The next patient on the list was Cynthia Vane, a young woman with a terrible toothache who probably would have preferred something cold and easy to eat instead of a heart-shaped balloon. But as sore as her mouth looked, the children dared not run and find her applesauce or an ice cream snack. 
They knew she might have read the Daily Punctilio in order to pass the hours in the hospital room and might recognize them if they showed their faces. Tra-la-la, fiddle-dee-dee, hope you get well soon. Ho, 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 and he, 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 have a heart-shaped balloon. On and on the volunteers marched, and Klaus and Sonny marched with them. But with every ho, 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 and he, 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 their hearts sank lower and lower. The two bottlers followed the members of BFD up and down the staircases of the hospital. And although they saw a great number of confusing maps, intercom speakers, and sick people, they did not catch a glimpse of their sister. They visited room 201 and sang to Jonah Maple, who was suffering from seasickness, and they gave a heart-shaped balloon to Charlie Anderson in room 714, who had injured himself in an accident, and they visited Clarissa Dalloway, who did not seem to have anything wrong with her, but was staring sadly out the window of room 1308. But nowhere in any of the rooms that the volunteers, volunteers marched into was Violet Baudelaire, who Klaus and Sonny feared was suffering more than any of the other patients. Kayun, Sonny said, as the volunteers walked up yet another staircase. She meant something along the lines of, We've been wandering around the hospital all morning, and we're no closer to rescuing our sister, and Klaus nodded grimly in agreement. I know, Klaus said, but the members of VFD are going to visit every single person in Hemlish Hospital. We're sure to find Violet eventually. Attention, attention, a voice announced, and the volunteers stopped singing and gathered around the nearest intercom speaker to hear what Mateus had to say. Attention, Mateus said. Today is a very important day. In the history of the hospital, in precisely one hour, a doctor will perform the world's first craniectomy, craniectomy on a 14-year-old girl. We all hope that this very dangerous operation is a complete success. That is all. Violet, Sunny murmured to her brother. I think so too, Klaus said, and I don't like the sound of that operation. Cranio means head, and ectomy is a medical term for removing something. Decap, Sonny asked in a horrified whisper. She meant something like, do you think they're going to cut off Violet's head? I don't know, Klaus said with a shudder, but we can't wander around with these singing volunteers any longer. We've got to find her right away. Okay, a volunteer called consulting the list. The next patient is Emma Bovary <laughs> in room 2611. Hmm. She's an author. Fun. Are all the rest authors? Oh, I'll have to be looking this up. She has food poisoning, so she needs a particularly cheerful attitude. Excuse me, brother, Klaus said to the volunteer, reluctantly using the term brother, instead of a person I hardly know. I was wondering if I could borrow your copy of the patient list? Of course, the volunteers replied. I don't like, the volunteer replied, sorry, I don't like to read all these names of sick people anyway. It's too depressing. I'd rather hold balloons. With a cheerful smile, the volunteer handed Klaus the long list of patients and took the heart-shaped balloon out of his hands as the bearded man began the next verse of the song. We sing to men with measles, and to women with the flu. And if you breathe in deadly germs, we'll probably sing to you. With his face exposed, Klaus had to duck, duck down behind Sonny's balloon to look at the list of the hospital patients. There are hundreds of people on this list, he said to his sister, and it's organized by ward, not by name. We can't read all, all, <laughs> we try again. We can't read it all here in the hallway, particularly when we both have to hide behind one balloon. Jabajat, Sonny said, pointing down the hall. By Jabajat, she meant something along the lines of, let's hide in that supply closet over there. And sure enough, there was a door marked supply closet. At the end of the hall, past two doctors who had paused to chat beside one of the confusing maps while the members of BFD started in on the chorus of their song as they walked towards Emma Bovary's room. Klaus and Sonny separated themselves from the volunteers and walked carefully towards the closet, holding the balloons in front of both their faces. 
as best as they could. Luckily, the two doctors were too busy talking about a sporting event they had watched on television to notice two accused murderers sneaking down the hallway of their hospital. And by the time the volunteers were singing, tra-la-la, fiddle-dee-dee, hope you get well soon, ho-ho-ho, and he-he-he, have a heart-shaped balloon, Klaus and Sonny were inside the closet. Like a church bell, a coffin, and a vat of melted chocolate, a supply closet is a really comfortable place to hide. And this supply closet was no exception. When they shut the door of the, clo the closet behind them, the two younger bottleheads found themselves in a small cramped room lit only by one foot flickering light bulb hanging from the ceiling. On one wall was a row of white medical coats hanging from the hooks, and on the opposite wall was a rusty sink where one could wash one's hands before examining a patient. The rest of the closet was full of huge cans of alphabet soup for patients' lunches and small boxes of rubber bands, which the children could not imagine came in very handy in a hospital. Well, Klaus said, it's not comfortable, but at least nobody will find us in here. Pesh, Sonny said, which meant something like, at least until someone needs rubber bands, alphabet soup, white medical coats, or clean hands. Well, <laughs> let's keep one eye on the door to see if anyone comes in, Klaus said, but let's keep the other eye on this list. It's very long, but now <laughs> that we have a few moments to look it over, we should be able to spot Violet's name. Right, Sonny said. Klaus placed the, the list on the top of the can of soup and hurriedly began to flip through its pages. As he had noticed, the list of patients was not organized alphabetically, but by ward, a word which here means particular section of the hospital. So the two children had to look through every single page, hoping to spot the name Violet Baudelaire among the typed names of sick people. But as they glanced at the list under the heading Sore Throat Ward, perused the names of the Broken Neck Ward page and combed through the names of all the people who were staying in the ward for people with nasty rushes, Klaus and Sonny felt as if they were in a ward for people with sinking stomachs. Because Violet's name was nowhere to be found. As the light bulb flickered above them, the two bottleheads looked frantically at, the page, at page after page, of the list that they found, and they found nothing that would help them locate their sister. She's not here, Sonny said, putting down the last page of the pneumonia ward. Violet's name is nowhere on this list. How are we going to find her in this huge hospital if we can't figure out what ward she's in? Alias, Sonny said, which meant maybe she's listed under a different name. Oh, that's true, Klaus said, looking at the list again. After all, Matthias' real name is Count Olaf. Maybe he made up a new name for Violet so we could rescue so we couldn't rescue her. But which person is really Violet? She could be anyone from Mikhail Bulgo hmm, one more time. Bulgakov. <laughs> Mikhail Bulgakov, who must be an author, and I must look him up. To Haruki Murakami. Oh, I love him. What are we going to do? Somewhere in this hospital, they're getting ready to perform completely unnecessary, a completely unnecessary operation on our sister, and we... Klaus was interrupted by the sound of a cracking voice coming from over the bottle air's heads. The two children looked up and saw that a square intercom speaker had been installed on the ceiling. Attention, Matea said when he was done laughing. Dr. Fluctano, please report to the surgical ward. Dr. Fluctano, please report to the surgical ward to prepare for the craniectomy. Fluctano, Sonny repeated. I recognize that name too, Klaus said. That's the false name used by Count Olaf's associates when we lived in Paltryville. Teofrek, Sonny said frantically. She meant Violet's in grave danger. We have to find her immediately, but Klaus did not answer. Behind his glasses, his eyes were half-closed, as they often were when he was trying to remember something he had read. Flactano, he remembered quietly. Flactano, he's sounding it out. Then he reached into his pocket, where he was keeping all the important papers. The bottle airs had gathered, all boon coots, 
he said, and took out one of the pages of the Quagmire's notebooks. It was the page that had they had written on in the words anagram, a phrase that had not made any sense to the Baudelaire's when they had looked at the pages together. Klaus looked at the Quagmire page and then at the list of patients and then at the page again. Then he looked at Sonny and she could see his eyes grow wide behind the glasses behind his glasses, the way they always did when he had read something very difficult and understood it at last. I think I know how to find Violet, Klaus said slowly, but we'll need your teeth, Sonny. Ready, Sonny said. Oh, let's try that again. Ready, Sonny said, opening her mouth. Klaus smiled and pointed to the stack of cans in the supply closet. Open one of those cans of alphabet soup, he said, and hurry. And that is the end of chapter eight. We'll continue with chapter nine very soon.